like to thank the organisers again for inviting me and the rest of you for listening to me whittering for far too long. Um, so today's lecture is going to be is subtitled Odds and Ends because it's uh, about a bunch of different projects which also come out of our of Darbu theorem or derived symplectic geometry which uh, I talked about in the first lecture. Um, parts of it are joint work with Oren Vittoria. Um, uh, Sven Meinhardt helped us with the uh, material on motives and Denis Borosov is the co-author on the parts about uh, Calabi R4 fold counting invariants. So, potentially I've got four sections. I suspect I'll probably actually only talk about these two. Um, so first I want to talk about motives. Um, by motive, in this talk I... Well, motives mean different things to different people. Here I mean rings of motives. So things are kind of universal Euler characteristics, things which generalise things like virtual Poincaré polynomials, virtual Hodge polynomials and so on. Uh, elements of rings rather than elements of categories. Um, then I want to talk about <coughs> uh, a, new, a new idea I'm quite excited about. Um, we're trying to define Donaldson Thomas style invariants counting coherent sheaves, uh, stable coherent sheaves on Calabi R fourfolds, uh, which will be deformation invariant integers to start off with. Um, two other topics um, I probably won't talk about, but you can ask me about later if you like, is cohomological Hall algebras for Calabi R folds and uh, the issue of gluing matrix factorization categories over minus one shifted symplectic um, derived schemes. So I don't care too much about talking about these because I haven't actually proved anything there. <coughs> um, okay, so let's start off uh, by talking about motives. Um, so the, the inspiration for this really came from Conservich and Soidelman's paper about motivic Donaldson Thomas invariants. So uh, if you have a Calabi R threefold, you can look at modulized phases of coherent sheaves on it. And Donaldson Thomas invariants are integers which count those coherent sheaves. They're basically weighted oil characteristics. Um, and, but Conservation and Zogman showed that you can generalize this to count in a much larger uh, ring than the integers, uh, rings of motives. Um, and to do that, you need a theorem a little bit like this. OK, so our theorem. Uh, which is joint with Vittoria and Sven Meinhardt, says that if you have uh, a de an algebraic decritical locus over some scheme K, so this doesn't make any sense over the complex, for complex analytic uh, case, um, which we now want to be a finite type, um, just because of our definition of motives, though there, there would be a, a local version of this um, involving uh, locally finite type schemes in which the, the ring of motives would be a kind of localized version. Um, so if you have a finite type decritical locus with orientation, the square root of its canonical bundle, um, then we can define a natural motive, MF of XS, uh, in uh, a special ring of motives, uh, M bar mu hat of X on X. So this is basically the same ring that Conservation and Soberman uh, used, defined in their 2009 paper uh, in order to put motivic Donaldson Thomas invariants in. Um, so such that uh, whenever your critical decritical locus is locally modelled on the critical locus of um, uh, a regular function on a smooth scheme U, then this motive, mf of xs, is locally modelled on this expression. So this is the motivic Milner fibre of U and F, uh, or if you like, the motivic nearby cycle. Um, if you subtract that from the motive of X itself, um, this gives you the motivic vanishing cycle, um, except we also put in a, a normalization by a power of the tape motive to minus the dimension of U on 2, because uh, this normalized version of the motivic vanishing cycle um, is the thing which is invariant under stabilization by quadratic forms. Um, so the stabilization by quadratic forms comes up all the time in this subject, and you have to to make sure that... Um, so no, that's exactly, yes. So L is the, uh, the motive of A1, basically, uh, in, in this context, yeah. Okay, um, so I'm going to 
bring this back in a minute. I'm going to uh, um, write on the board for a bit. Um, so uh, if x and x is a decritical locus, or if you like, uh, a minus one shifted symplectic derived scheme, then your favorite local model is this. You take some uh, R in X, should be the risky open. Um, some regular function F uh, from u into A1, where u is a smooth scheme. And then you also take an isomorphism, I, going from the open set R into the classical critical locus, grit of F. So I'm going to call uh, a quadruple of this kind um, R, U, S, I is a critical chart. Okay, so critical charts are our favourite kind of kind of coordinate patch on um, a decritical locus. So once you know what, what your coordinates are, next thing you need to know is how, to, how do you change coordinates. So uh, the problem is if you're given, uh, let's say, two such things, R, U, let's say R1, U1, R2, U2, F2, I2, two such coordinate patches, then how do you um, compare, uh, how do you compare coordinate patches? So then our favourite way to compare coordinate patches is this. comparison um, would be what I call an embedding. Um, of coordinate charts. So here, let's say, um, well, let's just take R1 equals R2, simplicity. Um, and let's say we have a map phi from U1 into U2, which is an embedding of classical schemes even a closed embedding, such that um, F1 is uh, F2 composed of phi, and um, phi restricted to crit of F1 um, is an isomorphism from crit of F1 to crit of F2, uh, which is actually kind of necessary because these are both isomorphic to R1. Okay, so um, it's then a, a fact that well, I kind of like to say that um, U2 looks like U1 cross um, a vector space, and F2 looks like F1 plus a sum of squares. And, sorry, yeah? I wonder if it's the well, I'll ask in a minute. OK. Um, OK, so then, complex analytically, um, this implies that U2 is isomorphic to U1 cross C to the K, uh, complex analytically locally, uh, and F2 gets identified with F1 plus Z1 squared plus, plus ZK squared. Okay? Um, so this is not true algebraically. Yeah? Yeah. 
uh, well, even then, well, you can, yes. Uh, even then, you can't diagonalize these, not without taking square roots. Uh, you could get um, an expression of this form, um, Q1Z1 squared plus QKZ squared, uh, where the QI is a function on U, functions on U1, complex analytic at Berkeley. Um, yeah, um, but in a sense, we, we kind of don't really care about this. Um, uh, what, 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 we, what we need to do is, whenever we want to... No, sorry, first let me say something else. Okay, so it's a fact that if we're given any two charts, critical charts, uh, R1, U1, F1, I1, and R2, U2, F2, I2. Well, we can't get an embedding between them, but we can embed both of them into something bigger. So then Zariski locally, uh, you can find a diagram R1, U1, F1, I1, R2, U2, F2, I2, and embeddings of both, phi1, phi2 into some SVGJ. So we can find, given any two charts and a point in the intersection of R1 and R2, we can find open neighborhoods in here and here, uh, and embeddings of those open neighborhoods into another chart here where the dimension of V may be bigger than dimensions of U1, U2. So you may, may need to add, add some extra dimensions um, in here. Um, so therefore, if we want to compare <coughs> things on here and things on here, it's enough to know how to compare this with that and that with that. Um, and that's our basic technique for working with the critical loci and things on them. So if we wanted to prove the perverse sheaf um, results I told you about last time, then we have to prove that the perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles of F1 on U1 is isomorphic to the perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles of G on V, and then uh, the perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles of U2 on F2 is isomorphic to that, and therefore the two, the two perverse sheaves of vanishing cycles from here and here become isomorphic as well. Um, and to prove the, the motive vanishing result, um, we need to... The, 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 the motive result I've just put up on the screen has now vanished. We just need to show that the, the motive... Uh, well, essentially, the motivic vanishing cycle of this agrees with the motivic vanishing cycle of that, um, and so on. OK. Um, and, OK, perhaps I won't say any more about that. Um, so, are we going to be able to bring back the... Uh, And yeah, so in order to prove that uh, theorem, which has now died horribly, um, we have to prove that under an embedding of critical charts, uh, the um, these, this normalized motivic vanishing cycle, uh, which I wrote down on the screen, is uh, is basically equal under, um, yeah, so, so this expression, you have to prove this is independent or, or unchanged by embeddings of critical charts. Um, and there's several ways of doing this. One is to use the, the kind of formal, um, uh, the kind of um, the motivic integration type um, expressions using uh, motivic zeta functions. Um, actually, an easier one is to use an expression for uh, motivic Milner fibers involving embedded resolutions of singularities. Because. Can these yeah? poses, they add up on an open covering? Uh, uh, so there's no matter of gluing, they just add up? Yes. Like a, a yeah, yes, yeah, so exactly. So, um, and this, this theorem is easier than the perverse sheaf theorem, because the perverse sheaf theorem is trying to produce objects in a category, this is trying to produce objects in a set. Um, yeah, so if you've got a finite open cover, then 
well, it basically, the, the motive on U1 union U2 is the motive on U1 plus the motive on U2 minus the motive on U1 in set U2. And if you've got more things, then you just do a, a, a bigger alternating sum. So, yeah, it, it, you only have to, you, there's no issues about gluing these things together as long as you know they agree um, whenever you compute them twice in two different ways. Okay, so that's our, um, our theorem. Um, next, uh, quite a nice result due to Davish Malek uh, is, tells you that you can actually localize, you can compute these motives by torus localization. Um, so let's suppose X and S uh, is an oriented and finite type decritical locus. Um, so I do need the finite type condition here because I'm going to take an absolute motive. Uh, I'm going to take the motive um, on X and then integrate it so I end up in the, um, the ring of motives over a point. Um, and that integration is only valid if X is the finite type. So we take a finite type decritical locus with a, an orientation. And let's suppose we have a, a, an action of GM, that's kind of C star, uh, the multiplicative group in the fields uh, acting on X, um, which should preserve the decritical structure. Um, well, so, okay, let, let's initially imagine that the decritical structure is scaled by some power lambda to the D uh, of the uh, GM action. Um, and the orientation squared to the conical line bundle is preserved. Um, now, in this particular case in which this power is zero, so the thing is, sorry? Uh, no, that D is short for derived. Um, uh, they're in different font anyway. So, um, okay, if the, if the power is zero, but we're not naught critical, then, um, and the action is good in the sense that you have, um, you can find affine group invariant sub subsets, make a cover, and circle compact, meaning that um, if you take a point in the decritical locus and you look at lambda times that point as lambda goes to zero, then it has a unique limit. Then Davish Malik, uh, well, there was a paper, but uh, it's never appeared on the archive yet, I don't know why. Um, so Davish Malik, proves a, a torus localization formula for this motive now not living on X but integrated so it lives over a point um, of the form. Okay, so the, basically the motivic, motivic Milner fiber of the whole of X is the sum over connected components of the fixed locus um, of the motivic Milner fiber of the fixed locus times a power of the taint motive, where the power is to the, well, you can define an index um, of the taint motive here. This is really the, um, if at a point in the fixed locus, you look at the, the tangent space, um, okay, so let's say x, x is in fixed locus, and then you look at tx, of the whole scheme. This is Tx of the um, fixed lo locus. So, so Gm acts on here linearly. This is just the, the fixed part. And then uh, the remaining things are non-trivial representations of Gm. Uh, so then we can say kind of positive powers of GM um, and we also have some negative powers of GM. So that is, um, we can split it into a vector subspace where GM acts as a direct sum of positive powers, another vector subspace where it acts by negative powers. And then the index is the is the dimension of the positive powers minus dimension of the negative powers in the obvious way. Um, and it turns out that this is 
locally constant in the point X in GM, and so it's, you can, it's a number associated to each connected component. Okay, so this is a very pretty formula. It means that um, these motives are actually really quite computable in, in examples, um, or at least simple type examples. Um, it would be interesting to extend this formula in some way to um, non-zero powers, and also to, to consider what kind of torus localization is possible for the perverse sheaves uh, I talked about last lecture. Okay. Um, so let's relate this to motivic Donaldson and Thomas invariants. So, uh, as I told you, the Calabi threefold, uh, its moduli schemes uh, are decritical loci. So if we apply all of this, um, if we have a, a, a classical moduli scheme, a finite type of coherent sheaves or complex of coherent sheaves uh, on Calabi threefold uh, with its natural obstruction theory E, and we suppose we're given a square root for the determinant line bundle of E, that's orientation data in the sense of consolidating Sobman, then we have a natural motive MS of MS on M. So this is, can be thought of as some kind of global motivic Milner fiber living on the uh, moduli scheme. Um, so this motive is essentially, or it's integral at least, is essentially the motivic Donaldson-Thomas invariant of that particular moduli space, which is defined, um, possibly with some conjectures, by Conte, Fisch, and Soberman in their big 2008 paper. Okay, so um, I don't think our theorem has actually filled any gaps in the theory. Uh, I think this was kind of known already, to be honest. But um, it does kind of clarify the picture a bit. Because Conservish and Zoidman, they just work at a point, really. They work with motivic Milner fibers of formal Fauer series at each point of M. And they don't really tell you whether the, motivic, whether the power series converges or how it varies from point to point. But our results show that these formal power series can be taken to be a regular function on the smooth scheme um, and that uh, they can tell you kind of how they change from point to point. Um, so it just you know, makes the picture look nicer, basically. Um, okay. Yeah. So on Wednesday, uh, you mentioned that your perverse sheet results lifted to the cosmodular results, which is yeah. the characteristic zero slice mm -hmm. of the motivic results. So you have much more precise results in the, in the, zero, in the characteristic zero setting. How does it, what's the difficulty of those more, of those results with the right characteristics compared to these results with the right characteristics? Um, well, this, this is characteristic zero. Um, but then you proved your results on Wednesday because you told us that the perverse sheaves were actually mixed Hodge modules. Uh, well, no, mixed Hodge modules only work over C. Okay. Mixed Hodge modules only work over C. Oh, okay. This works over arbitrary fields. Okay. Uh, and okay. I don't know that the Grothendieck group of mixed Hodge modules captures the entirety of the okay. Grothendieck group of motives. Captured a lot. Yes. This is easier, basically, um, because, well, it, it's at one categorical level down. So for the first sheaf gluing, or mixed Hodge modules gluing picture, we have to think about, um, on each open set, we produce a mixed Hodge module. On each double overlap, we produce an isomorphism. And then on, on each triple overlap, we have to show that the isomorphism is composed associatively. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's, how we that's what we had to do to prove the mixed Hodge module results. Um, yeah, so, so for this thing, um, we have to prove, on each open set, we have to prove, we have to construct a motive. On each overlap, we have to prove that the, <coughs> the overlaps, are, the motives are equal, and then we stop there. We don't have to go to triple intersections. Um, so in that sense, it is a simpler proof. Uh, what's localization? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, well, so there is a stack um, generalization of this, which is boring, but possibly important. Um, and that's, this says that if you have a decritical stack, um, a finite type, and we also 
impose a slightly irritating condition that it's locally a global quotient. It ought to be a kind of technical thing which we don't need, but I can't, don't, we don't know how to prove it without it. Um, but this is known to be true for moduli of coherent sheaves, though not for moduli of complexes. Under these conditions, we can construct a natural motive, MF of XS, uh, in a certain ring of motives on the stack. So this is again basically Conservish and Soibelman's um, uh, motive, a ring of motives, although Conservish and Soibelman only actually defined their um, motive in the case in which it was a global quotient. So such that, actually no, perhaps that's not quite true, okay. Anyway, such that if you take a smooth atlas uh, for your scheme, then the, uh, the pullback of the motive on the stack is equal to the motive on the scheme coming from the previous scheme, uh, the previous theorem, multiplied by the, uh, the, the tape motive to the power of uh, the relative dimension of the smooth morphism over two. Um, okay, so again, for Columbia, I have three moduli stacks. These uh, motives of stacks are basically the conservation Zoidman's motivic Donaldson and Thomas invariants. Okay, um, so that's where I go through. Okay, so now I want to move on to the, the next part. So all the rest of this lecture is not finished yet. It's either work in progress or things that haven't started yet. And the result in quotes means we haven't finished the proof. Um, okay, so I want now to talk about um, counting invariants for coherent sheaves on Calabi R4 folds. So just to recall uh, the main features of the Calabi R3 fold case, Donaldson Thomas invariants, let's take Y to be a Calabi R3 fold, let's say over the complex numbers, then the Donaldson Thomas invariants, DT alpha of Tor, uh, are integers or sometimes rational numbers counting stable or semi stable coherent sheaves on Y with some fixed churn character alpha, uh, where tor is a stability condition, let's say gives a stability. Um, and to, so we were first defined by Richard Thomas in 1998, and at that time, the main property, and the, the, only, the only fact he really proved about them, was that these number, these Donaldson Thomas invariants are unchanged under continuous deformations of the underlying Calabi manifold Y. So that is, that, that should be surprising, if you like, because um, as you deform Y, uh, the moduli spaces of schemes change radically. Um, you know, they can kind of whole connected components can kind of pop in and out of existence. So it's surprising that you should be able to do a counting, uh, some way of counting these in a way which doesn't change under deformations. Uh, also, later on, it turned out that these transformed by a Wolkhoffing formula uh, when you change the stability condition at all. Okay, so we have. Uh, moduli schemes of stable sh sheaves and semi-stable sheaves um, uh, where the semi-stable moduli space is proper and the stable moduli, schemes, uh, uh, stable moduli scheme have a, an obstruction theory, a symmetric obstruction theory in the kind of sense. So then the easy case, uh, which is what Richard Thomas did in his thesis, uh, is when there are no strictly semi-stables, so the case in which the semi-stable moduli space equals the stable moduli case. So in that case, you have a proper moduli, uh, a proper scheme with an obstruction theory. Um, and so you can use the Berto um, uh virtual cycle construction. Uh, so the Donaldson Thomas invariant is a virtual cycle, which automatically has dimension zero, of this proper scheme with obstruction theory and stable moduli space. Okay? So in this case, also uh, by PTVV, the derived moduli scheme. Uh, of stable things is a minus one shifted symplectic scheme uh, by PTVV and the, the classical moduli scheme is its classical ramification and it's also a decritical locus by what I said last lecture. Um, okay, so this is what I'd like to generalize to the Calabi R4 case. Okay, so what I'm talking about is joint work with Denis Borosov. Uh, so there is a preprint which you can find on his um, website, if you just Google Dennis Borosov. Um, I don't promise that what's on the website at the moment is either readable or correct, but uh, it will eventually become both, uh, I hope. Um, okay, so we're developing a similar story for Calabi R4 folds. So the aim is to define invariants which count um, stable or semi stable coherent sheaves on Calabi R4 folds. So, um, as in Richard Thomas's original paper, he called Calabi R3 Donaldson Thomas invariants holomorphic Casson invariants. 
So Catholic invariants are, are invariants of real free manifolds, and so holomorphic Catholic invariants are a kind of complexified version of this. Okay, so the things we want to define, you should think about them as holomorphic Donaldson invariants. So they're much more like Donaldson invariants of four manifolds, so things counting instantons, but a complexified version. Okay, so this is not a new idea. Um, the idea for doing this goes back to Donaldson and Thomas in 1998, a paper called um, uh, Gauge Theory in High Dimensions or something like that. Um, Ed Siegel also wrote a very important paper about this. Uh, he was kind enough to put Simon Donaldson's name on the top as well. Um, anyway, so using... So that the motivation for, for this came from Gauge Theory. Uh, so you want to count, in some sense, modelized spaces of spin-7 instantons on a Calabi-L4 manifold or more generally, uh, on a spin 7 manifold. And perhaps I can tell you a little bit about what this means. So, um, we're interested in holomorph, well, let's say vector bundles on a Calabi-R4 manifold with connection. Okay, so Y is our Calabi-R4. Uh, e over et Y can be a, a vector bundle. Uh, with connection, nabla, and then S is the curvature, which is basically a two-form with values in the endomorphisms of E. Um, so we want to know about two forms on Y. So lambda 2 of T star of Y, this is now just in the sense of the reals, we can split it as, well, there's the multiples of the Kähler form, and there's the trace free 1, 1 forms um, and then there's the kind of lambda 2, 0 plus 0, 2 bits so, well, the, the real part of lambda 2, 0, if you like so these have got uh, dimensions 1 and uh, 15 and um, 12 ok, so Hamish-Neinstein equation, so the Hamish-Neinstein equations uh, make, have to be zero in here and zero in there. So a connection is Hermitian Einstein if it's, well, Hermitian Einstein and has C1 equals zero means that its curvature component in the direction of omega is zero and the, the two zero part of its curvature is also zero. So this is too many equations. Sorry, perhaps I should have said that uh, it's known that any um, stable, well, it's a Gibbs stable holomorphic vector bundle on your Calabi Yau has a unique Hermitian Einstein connection. Um, so we can find solutions of this, but if we want to think about this as an equation from the point of view of analysis, it's in some sense not a very nice one because it's overdetermined. Uh, there's really um, kind of eight parameters worth of, var of, of variation in the connection, but we're imposing um, 13, uh, actually 14, um, equations. Uh, okay. Uh, so there's basically too much curvature there. Now if you think about this as a spin 7 problem, so uh, any Calabi R4 thing has an SE4 structure, SE4 is contained in spin 7, um, it turns out to be natural to split um, this thing into two pieces. So this becomes an R6 plus an R6. Um, so the spin 7 instanton equation um, is, says that you want the components of curvature in, in the direction of omega to vanish and in only one of these two pieces, let's say the lambda plus, to vanish. Um, so the spin 7 instanton equation is a, a weaker um, e equation than the Hermitian Einstein condition. Uh, it, it, it requires a smaller component of curvature to vanish. So you'd think that the Hermitian Einstein, uh, the, the Einstein connections would be a closed subset, uh, but possibly quite a small closed subset of the spin 7 instantons. However, it turns out that, at least set theoretically, Hermitian Einstein connections are both open and closed because there's some curvature integral equation which tells you that if you have a, a spin 7 instanton 
uh, solution on a bundle uh, which could possibly be the, uh, well, which has the same churn, churn character as something which could be holomorphic, then the, the spin 7 internal equations imply the Hermitian Einstein uh, equations because basically you can show that the L2 norm of the final uh, piece of uh, curvature in here is zero. Okay, so um, now, so the spin 7 instanton equations form moduli spaces which are basically quasi smooth. They're solutions of elliptic equations. Uh, spin 7 instanton moduli spaces ought to have virtual cycles. You should be able to count them and make invariants. But in the gauge theory approach, you run into problems because um, moduli spaces of solutions of gauge theoretic equations, such as instanton equations, typically have very nasty singularities. Um, uh, so in four dimensions, you can more or less control these because singularities happen at points. Uh, in eight dimensions, singularities happen in co-dimension four. So you're trying to understand what happens when something bad happens along some house dimension co-dimension four set. Uh, so uh, compactifying higher dimensional gauge theory modelized spaces is, is very difficult. Um, perhaps at this point I could mention a, a paper by Yelong Kao um, on the archive last year. He's a student of um, Conan Lung. Uh, he's obviously very bright. Uh, so the, there's a substantial overlap between his project and ours, um, but uh, we're not that worried because he actually assumes everything we're trying to prove, more or less. Um, but uh, there's some nice examples of um, calculations of what these uh, Donaldson Thomas style invariants ought to be. Okay, um, so our approach is different. So rather than using gauge theory, we're going to stay within algebraic geometry. So we're going to take our, our moduli spaces, our input moduli spaces are, are going to be um, Calabi R4 moduli schemes. So we're going to get compactness of moduli spaces more or less three. So you just have to choose, let's say, a primitive um, churn character alpha and a sufficiently generic uh, uh, stability condition, and then you're guaranteed that your stable moduli scheme equals your semi-stable moduli scheme, and it'll be proper. Okay, so let's suppose why the Calabi R4 manifolds. Alpha is some churn character. Um, and we suppose that the semi-stable and the stable moduli schemes are, are the same. So that's the easy case. So then we have a, a proper moduli scheme. Um, and the corresponding derived moduli scheme in bold is minus 2 shifted symplectic by PTVV. So this need not have virtual dimension 0. Uh, that's parallel to the fact that in the Do uh, Donaldson invariant case, moduli spaces of instantons on 4 manifolds don't have to have dimension 0. And then you in order to count them, you find some other, um, you form a, a virtual cycle of positive dimension and then you integrate some uh, kind of universal classes over it to get a number. Okay, so what we want to do is to define a virtual cycle for this, uh, minus, this proper minus two shifted symplectic um, derived scheme. Uh, and in fact, our construction also works not just in the club, in for club L4 moduli schemes, but for any minus two shifted, shifted symplectic derived scheme. Okay, so uh, just to kind of compare it to more normal problems, there is a natural obstruction theory uh, on this uh, thing, phi e into Lm. However, this obstruction theory is perfect in degrees minus 2 up to 0, not minus 1 up to 0. So therefore, the usual Berent and Fantacci virtual cycles do not work. You know, Berent and Fantacci quite rightly need their um, cotangent complexes to live in here, uh, and you know, just in the no ordinary way of things, you, you would expect that something with an obstruction theory living in a larger interval, you should not be able to define deformation invariant virtual cycles. It's just impossible. Um, but in this Calabi R4 case, um, something special happens. There's a kind of coupling between what happens in degree 0 and degree minus 2, and then minus 1 is kind of self-dual to itself. So what we're able to do is, to, in effect, to cut the obstruction theory in half. We throw away the minus 2 piece and half of the minus 1 piece. Uh, and then we get something which does live in minus 1 up to 0. Okay, so here's part of what um, we're aiming to prove. Um, and you can find a... Well, this is written in the preprint I told you about. Um, so the theorem will say if x and omega is a minus 2 shifted symplectic derived schemes uh, over the complex numbers, you can insist on that, um, then we can construct uh, a D-manifold so I like putting things with um, 
D in front of them, and D is not equal to zero in this case. Uh, so a D manifold, meaning a, a, a derived smooth manifold, um, XDM, which has the same underlying topological space, X, as the shifted symplectic scheme uh, with the complex analytic topology. So this construction involves arbitrary choices, but uh, the D manifold is unique up to bordisms, uh, and even more than that, it's unique up to bordisms which fix the underlying topological space, X. Um, so the real virtual dimension of our drive smooth manifold is um, the virtual dimension of the D manifold over R is the complex virtual dimension of the, uh, the complex object bold X. This is half of the real virtual dimension of X. So this is exactly half of what you'd expected. Okay, so I have to work over the complex numbers. We have to use the complex analytic topology. And this thing we're constructing here really is a real object. Okay, so we're, we've wandered out of our algebraic geometry completely, really. Um, so this is something on the face of it which doesn't stand a chance of working over other fields, although I'll talk about something which may work over other fields later. Um, okay, so I haven't really got time to explain D manifolds properly, um, but you can look at my web page. There's a, a page on D manifolds. Um, there's two archive papers um, in 2012. Uh, there's also a 750 page book um, which you can read there, and I'm rewriting it from the beginning. Uh, so come back in five years' time and it'll be finished. Um, but two useful facts about D manifolds. Firstly, uh, your favorite local models for D manifolds uh, are Kuronishi neighborhoods, um, or consisting of a real manifold V, uh, a real vector bundle E over V, uh, and a smooth section S of the bundle E, um, such that the topological space of um, the D-manifold is locally homeomorphic to the zeros of this section, S inverse of zero in V. Um, so if you're happy with, you know, you can think about XDM as being locally a homotopy fiber product in some infinity category or two category of derived smooth objects, the homotopy fiber product of V crossover E with itself V, where the maps are the section and the zero section. Um, so any derived manifold has a dimension, which can be negative. The dimension of this is dimension of V minus the rank of E. Um, secondly, any, comp any D manifold, X, can be perturbed to an ordinary manifold X twiddle, uh, and you retain compactness. If the D manifold is compact, then the order manifold X is compact. Uh, and this is unique up to bordism. Um, and to see how to do this locally is easy. Given the Kuronishi neighborhood V, E, and S, you just perturb S a little bit to a generic section, S twiddle V, and then S, the S twiddle becomes transverse to the zero section, and the zeros of S twiddle in V is a submanifold uh, of dimension dim V minus rank E. Okay, so if X and omega is a proper and minus two shifted symplectic derived scheme, then this theorem, in quotes, will give us a bordism class uh, of compact manifolds X twiddle, and this is basically a virtual cycle. Um, if we just do it, as I said, uh, the manifolds don't have orientation, so we get a bordism class of unoriented um, manifolds, and this only gives you a virtual cycle over Z2, because you don't know what sign to count things with, basically. Um, but uh, if we add some extra data, we can do better than this. So let's talk about orientations. If we want to do virtual cycles over the integers rather than over Z2, we need to include orientations of X and omega and of the C manifold. So let's, okay, in the, case, in the minus one shifted case, if X and omega is a minus one shifted derived screen, that's a Calabi-R3 case, then an orientation of X and omega is a choice of square root line bundle uh, for the determinant line bundle of the cotangent complex. So those were introduced by Conservation and Zoltman. Uh, and we need them for both the motivic version uh, I just talked about and the categorified version of the perverse sheaf theory. So the Calabi R4 analog of this should be as follows. If X and omega is a minus two shifted symplectic derived scheme, then there is a natural isomorphism from the square of the um, 
determinant line bundles of cotangent complex into the structure sheaf. Okay, um, so you can get in the in the Clavier four case, uh, well, in the modelized scheme case, you can get get this by thinking about serial duality. So basically, in in the Clavier odd case, serial duality tells you that the determinant line bundle is isomorphic to itself. Tells you nothing. In the Clavier even case, serial duality tells you that the determinant line bundle is isomorphic to its dual, and therefore that its square is isomorphic to the structure sheaf. So um, you only yeah, so serial duality only really tells you something interesting about the determinant line bundle for Clavier even. Um, then an orientation of X and omega we define to be a choice of isomorphism of the determinant line bundle with the structure sheaf, which squares to this natural isomorphism. Okay? So again, an orientation is a square root, but it's a square root of a morphism, not a square root of a line bundle. So in the Clavier 4 case, these orient these, this notion of orientation data is simpler than the Clavier 3 case. It, it's, it's one categorical level down um, from the Clavier 3 case. It's a morphism in the category, not an object in the category. So these things are kind of they're unique up to sign rather than being unique up to isomorphism. Um, okay, so that's what we define an orientation to be. Um, so once we prove the, the theorem, these two things are going to follow from it in a simple way. Uh, so a lemma is that in the theorem there should be a natural one-to-one -one correspondence between orientations on the minus two shifted symplectic derived scheme uh, in the sense I've just said. This means an isomorphism of uh, sorry, this means a, yeah, an isomorphism of the of line bundles between the um, determinant line bundle cotangent complex <coughs> and the structure sheaf, and orientations on the drive manifold XDM. Uh, that this is a natural D manifold version of orientations on a classical manifold. Um, and then a corollary to this would be that <coughs> if you have X and omega is a proper and oriented minus well minus two shifted symplectic derived scheme. Then we will construct a bordism class, let's go brackets XDM, of compact oriented manifolds. Um, and we consider this to be a virtual cycle. So um, this will basically give you a real homology class. Um, if the virtual dimension is zero, then, this, then the, the, the appropriate bordism group is just the integers. So we, we will count it and get an integer. Um, OK, so all of the data we start with it's strictly complex algebraic. Okay? There's, there's nothing real or whatever about this. Um, it's a complex uh, derived scheme, and the orientation is, a, again, a complex object. However, because of this business of halving dimension, this virtual cycle we construct can have odd real dimension. So that, that feels to me to be very weird, uh, and very unlike the, the standard kind of Berndt and Fantecci style virtual cycles, which live let's say, in Chow groups, um, and the Chow, the Chow homology groups are kind of automatically even dimensional because they are, you know, they're made out of complex things whose real dimension is even. Um, so this is very unlike the kind of standard algebraic geometry approaches to virtual cycles. Um, okay, so here's a sketch proof of this quote theorem. Um, so let's say x and omega to be a minus two shifted symplectic derived scheme over C. So then the, the Darboo theorem I talked about in the first lecture gives us local models for x and omega in this risky topology. Uh, so I've already told you about this a little bit. Um, in the minus two shifted case, you can reduce these local models to the following data. Firstly, a smooth C scheme U, which you might like to think about as a complex manifold. Secondly, an algebraic vector bundle E over U, Think about this as a holomorphic vector bundle. And then thirdly, uh, a section S, so if you like a holomorphic section. And finally, a non-degenerate quadratic form Q on E, so a complex quadratic form uh, which is non-degenerate and such that the section S is null, Q of S, S is zero. Okay, so the underlying topological space of X is locally identified with the zeros of the section as a uh, C subscheme or complex analytic subspace or just topological subset of U. The virtual dimension of X is twice the dimension of U minus the rank of E. So you might not be, have been expecting that too. Um, so the cotangent complex LX of X uh, is, well, T star of U in degree zero. That's 
fairly obvious. Uh, e star in degree minus 1, that's also fairly obvious because the E are the relations. What's less obvious is that we also have a copy of TU in degree minus 2. So these are kind of relations on relations. Um, and so the reason why we have this 2 here is that the, the generators in degree minus 2 contribute in a positive way to the dimension. So basically rank of that plus rank of that is twice dimension of U. And then we subtract rank of that. Okay, um, so we're, we're going to halve the virtual dimension, so it's kind of good that we've got a 2 there, because uh, that drops out. Okay, so here's how to bid, build the drive manifold XDM locally. So we regard E over U now as a real vector bundle over U, which we're regarding now as a real manifold, real smooth manifold. And we choose a splitting E into E plus direct sum E minus, where, okay, so these are now real subbundles which definitely aren't complex subbundles. So in fact, E minus is I times E plus. Uh, and we split it so that the quadratic form, Q on E plus, is real and positive definite. And then the Q on E minus is real and negative definite. And Q between these two things is imaginary. Okay, so then we, we write the section S as an S plus direct sum an S minus, where S plus lives in E plus, S minus lives in E minus. Uh, it's not true that S minus is I times E plus. These sections S plus and S minus, they're kind of algebraically different, maybe in some sense independent from each other. Um, so then we define XDM to be locally the derived fiber product of U over E plus with U using zero and S plus. So basically, XDM is S plus inverse of zero. Okay, so the original shifted symplectic scheme X is the zeros of all of S. The new de the derived manifold X is the zeros only of S plus. Okay, so we're kind of setting S plus equal to zero, but we might have S minus non-zero, at least in some um, non-reduced scheme kind of sense. So on the face of it, um, the, the complex object is a sub-scheme of the real object, at least at the classical level. Um, okay, but something interesting happens. Uh, because Q of SS is zero, that tells us that the norm of S plus squared is the norm of S minus squared, um, where the norms are defined on E plus and E minus are defined using plus or minus the real part of Q. So basically, you take the real part of the equation. So real part of Q applied to S, S is 0 tells you that mod S plus squared minus mod S minus squared is 0. OK, so therefore, set theoretically, we have that um, the zeros of S are equal to the zeros of S plus, because S plus equals 0 implies S minus equals 0 implies S equals 0. So that's why X and the, the smooth D-manifold, XDM, have the same topological space X. Um, although, scheme theoretically, they're, they're different. You know, the, the underlying C infinity scheme of the, class, uh, of the complex object is only a sub scheme of the underlying C infinity of XDM because, scheme theoretically, S, S minus is more or less independent of S plus. Um, well, okay, so the, the square is dependent on the square of that, but um, as, as non reduced schemes, XDM and X are different. Okay, so then the, this part is all fairly straightforward. Uh, the difficult bit is to show that we can choose compatible splittings, E is E plus plus E minus, on some open cover of um, neighborhoods on X, and then glue these local models to make a, a global D manifold XDM. Um, and it's clear this is going to work, uh, and we have a, uh, a, fairly, a, a fairly complete but possibly incorrect argument in that paper which tells you how to do it. Okay, um, so I'd like also to try and relate this to the perverse sheaf picture, which I talked about uh, on Tuesday. Um, so, if X and omega is again an oriented minus two shifted symplectic derived scheme over C, for instance, the Calabian four manifold derived moduli scheme. Um, so, let's regard the point star as being an oriented minus one shifted symplectic derived scheme in a trivial way. So it has symplectic form zero. So then that has a, a perverse sheaf, which is just the constant perverse sheaf Q at the point star, or whatever your base ring is. So the projection, pi, going from our minus two shifted symplectic scheme into the point, 
is Lagrangian in the point, in the sense of BTVV. So therefore, the conjecture I stated last lecture uh, tells you there should be a natural morphism, mu, from the constant sheaf on X, shifted by the virtual dimension of X, into the shriek pullback of the perverse sheaf of vanishing cycles on the point, which is just the constant sheaf on the point. The shriek pullback of that is the Verge dual of the um, constant sheaf on X. Okay, so if we take half the cohomology, uh, this should give us a linear map from the compactly supported um, co uh, cohomology of X in dimension the virtual dimension of X over the rationals into the rationals. Okay, so if we believe the conjecture in lecture two, then uh, from this data of an oriented minus two shifted symplectic scheme, we should straight away get a linear map from the cohomology of X into the rationals. Um, so if X is compact, uh, you would expect this to be, well, it is uh, contraction with the class in the homology of X. Um, so let's write that as X vert uh, in the uh, homology of X in the virtual dimension of X. So note that a kind of halving of dimension has happened here because this is a complex virtual dimension of X, but I'm taking homology in what's in effect real dimensions. Okay, so I, I expect that this, um, this homology class in the homology of class of X to be essentially the virtual cycle uh, above using the appropriate map from bordism to homology. Okay, so that's a bit more subtle. Really, you want to map X into some target um, and the bordism into some target as a well, bulb. Whatever. Uh, they're essentially the same thing. Okay, but this per perverse sheaf story should also work on fields K other than the complex numbers. Um, however, the perverse sheaf picture does not obviously explain why this um, homology class should be in any sense deformation invariant, uh, whereas the, the D-manifold picture, deformation invariance is quite straightforward there. We can just work over, we can work in families of things over a base, and we will be able to prove that you know, if you have a, let's say if you have a, a family of minus two shifted symplectic things over a complex curve, then the bordism class you get is deformation invariant over that complex curve. Um, so, and it, there may be some kind of perverse sheaf approach to these things which enables you to somehow prove deformation invariance in a strictly perverse sheafy way. And that would be an interesting project, but I have no idea myself how to do it. Um, how are we doing? Okay. I think I, I will bail out at this point. And, uh, um, okay. Thank you for listening to me. Um,